I'm Davey, welcome back to Cinema Flicks and Music Picks. So I'm your host with the most and the beast with the least, the meanie with the beanie. And the least we can do today is uh, box out Wednesdays. Yeah, like I said, but we're going to cheat a little bit. We're going to cheat. It's not going to be box sets today. It's going to be bundled today. Um, so this morning, so we're now in the afternoon, we're about half past one, um, but 10 a.m., the postman knocked the door um, and dropped off this month's indicator bundle, which is always exciting. Um, but one of the films I've just been desperate to see ever since Indicator announced it, so I watched it straight away. Um, with the curtains drawn, as they are drawn here for the natural light was too powerful. Daylight in Scotland is just, just I'm not used to it. Um, so, I thought I'd give you thoughts on a couple of the movies, because I've seen one of the other ones, and then just show you the other two, which I've yet to check out, but you know. Give you a wee sneak preview if you've ordered as well. But really, it's to recommend one of them in particular, because I had something else planned, but one of these movies I put on, I thought, that's my, you know, I've been looking forward to it, and then I watched it and went, whoa, whoa. So, um, this is our indicator bundle um, for the month. Um, so, we'll, we'll, we'll start here. This is um, A Time for Dying, Bud Bodica's um, last film. Indicator, of course, did the, the Bodiker set um, with the Randolph Scott renowned cycle um, with everything except for Seven Men from now because of uh, Paramount having the rights. Um, haven't seen this one. Um, only he knew it was a time for dying. This was no ordinary rain, this was chubby rain. Um, so see Courtney Joyner, who recently saw one of my other reviews. Um, there's an audio commentary on here. There's a filmmaker and novelist Christopher Pettit discusses his fascination uh, for the film and, and uh, his reasons for selecting it as one of Sight and Sound's best films of all time in the last poll. Um, and a 20 minute interview with Kim Newman um, about various interpretations of Jesse James on screen. Um, so, yeah. That'd be worth watching, but um, it's also uh, Audie Murphy plays Jesse James, and this one's a little bit old to, by this point to play Jesse, but you know, it's the westerns. Who's gonna say naughty Audie Murphy? So, this will be good, this will be solid. I'm looking forward to watching that because Bud Bodicker's last movie, or no, sorry, it's not his last, is it his last western? I know it's his last something, <laughs> something big. It's definitely Audie Murphy's last movie before he became. We're in the money, and then he did die young, didn't he? Uh, relatively, um, and um, yeah, there's been a million Jesse James movies even s since then, hasn't there? I suppose the the assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford um, was uh, was the most prominent recently. This one is the Phantom of the Monastery by Fernando de Fuentes. Cursed be he who turns to flesh and forgets God. Um, so this is um, one half of this month's Mexican horror double bill. And this is the one I ain't seen. So this is from a new 4K restoration. Kim Newman's back on here doing an audio commentary with his buddy Stephen Jones. Um, head programmer of um, a Mexican film festival considers the impact of this early horror classic. English subtitle, well, we'd expect that. We don't speak Spanish, most of us over here. We're ignorant little, little Britons. Now the two I have seen. Okay, the two I have seen, but I've not. We'll do this one first because I haven't seen this particular edition, but I've seen the film. Um, the film, uh, not quite Hollywood, about um, the Australian film industry. It came out about a decade ago, made me check this one out. Um, and it is Mad Dog Morgan, starring Dennis Hopper. Um, and this, by God, um, 
somehow it's a 15 but I, when I watched it I would have swore it would have been an 18 because it was pretty intense um, so I don't know if it's been revisited and re-rated but new restoration um, two presentations so the director's cut and Mad Dog uh, which is the UK and US version um, so maybe that's why maybe the different version gives a different rating um, audio commentary with the director and film critic Jake Wilson um, and an another audio commentary with the director from uh, 10 years earlier behind the scenes documentary with uh, following Dennis Hopper around um, the director reflects on working with Dennis Hopper a conversation with Dennis Hopper uh, looking back in 2008 and then 67 minutes of outtakes from Not Quite Hollywood, the, the one that I was just talking about, uh, the the documentary, which is a great documentary. If you th if you think you know Australian film, watch Not Quite Hollywood because it goes way into the weeds, you know, from the kind of raunchy exploitation stuff to, to Mad Max and everything in between. Um, locations revisited, um, intro and outro from the director, you know, everything you'd want, absolutely everything. A uh, limited edition of 4,000 for the US and UK, and this is, because you know, numbers matter, so this is 1,053, I'm, I'm glad I got 1,053, it's, you know, if it was 1,200 or something, it just wouldn't have been worth owning. Um, so this is a fantastic movie. It's got Dennis Hopper and peak Dennis Hopper form, but just controlled enough. So he's he's way out there, but it serves the purpose of the film. So you're not getting unhinged Dennis Hopper to the detriment of the film for a change. Um, you're getting it to service the film. Um, and as you can tell by the fact that he and the director I mean, there's some original art for you there, um, but he and the director um, are on speaking terms years later. Um, it was a less troubled production than the last movie, which indicator also did one of these nice thicker box sets for. Um, but there's still some fascinating stuff behind the scenes um, to, to hear about, because even the old uh, Australian Blu-ray has got some, some great stuff, including quite a bit that's carried on to this. Now, the one that I really wanted to talk to you about is what I watched this morning when it came. It is La La Rona. Um, the, the Wailing Woman, I believe, is the kind of translation, but it's the um, it's apparently a very popular folk tale in, in Mexico. Um, and, um, oh God, how do you... A lot of the things I've seen online about it mention, oh, this was happening at the same time as Universal Horror and it's Mexico's answer to it. Well, it may be the, literally the, the answer to it in terms of that's what they were doing at the same time. But for me, it's much more representative of something like, if you've seen Intolerance by D.W. Griffith, imagine that was a horror film because it jumps around in time in a way that is so far ahead of of um, anything that you would have seen like Universal for example um, where I mean 1931's Dracula and this is 1933 uh, so this was the year of uh, what was 33 the bread Frankenstein yeah but just about then um, the year after Frankenstein two years after Dracula um, but you would n they were all quite straight narratives, especially Dracula, because it was based on a stage, uh, stage play and it looked very stagey. And um, Todd Browning's direction was quite stodgy. He would go on to direct Freaks, which was much more cinematic. Um, but everything was very straight on, and the narrative was just this happens, then this happens, and you know, there was nothing particularly interesting about the way the story was told. But this, oh my god. Um, so you don't even need to worry about this being a spoiler because it's the premise of the film. A mother kills her children out of jealousy because her new husband is paying too much attention to them. And that is La Llorona, the wailing woman. A mother who kills her children is destined to be a spirit um, who haunts. Um, and the... <laughs> 
what Th this sounds bizarre, but with it, we don't just see modern day Mexico and see this happen, and you know, then cut to somewhere else. We go back hundreds of years to the like, conquistadors and things, you know, in Elizabethan times and whatnot. Um, I'll get the booklet here. So, I mean, everything looks very early cinema, doesn't it? Early uh, talky. Um, but by God, the narrative itself is where you want to go. I mean, there we go with your. Uh, what do you call those things? A rough? I feel like that's not what it's called, but... Um, so, the Wailing Woman herself there, um, but it's it's a legend that I didn't know about, and by God, by God, it is quite terrifying. And it's got that thing that the Phantom Carriage has, Victor Schustrom's film from, from the early 20s, if you've ever seen that. Where it feels like someone in someone else's ancient folklore, which it is, of course. Um, but it's so terrifying and so uh, visceral, so real, so horrible that you. I mean, for goodness' sake, look at that shot. You know. You look past anything to do with is the film dated. I stopped concentrating on, um, you know, the things that were very early talky, you know, like your know, very low budget because obviously Universal had more money than, than these guys down in Mexico did. Um, but the story and what was happening, I just could not believe. And then it just jumps time zones. I mean, I'm wearing a Twin Peaks t shirt here. If David Lynch was a Mexican born in 1900, he would have made La Llorona. I mean, it, it's so postmodern for the times. If they made this today, people would be saying, it's a bit tricky, you need to keep up with the narrative here. Even today, I promise you, this holds up as a wonderful example of, of um, split narratives and uh, time jumps and... and um, actions of, of one event affecting another and, and you know it's, it's it's just fantastic it is absolutely fantastic and i cannot recommend this one enough this is if you don't buy the bundle for a indicator this month then at least buy this because this to me is just wow find the uh, moderate threat from the bbfc uh, warning here moderate threat no there's real threat these this woman ain't for play. She would give the woman in black nightmares. Bloody images, yes. Suicide, yes. Violence, oh hell yes. For the time, I mean, it's still got a 12 rating now. For the time, I can't imagine that this wouldn't have been banned in the US or the UK. It's just, even even this morning, watching and finishing this afternoon, it was just horrific. So this has got another audio commentary with Kim Newman and Stephen Jones, which I'm looking forward to listening to tonight, hopefully. Um, documentary by Vivana Garcia Bezne, the producer's great granddaughter, um, giving a personal history of the film. Not sure how personal it'll be if it's a great granddaughter. I don't know much about my great grandparents. Um, transcending time. Um, Abraham Castillo Flores. I'm just putting all the th 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 into the pronunciations because, you know, it seems right. Head programmer who we saw in the last film. Uh, talks about the myth and the film, um, a short compilation of the distinctive uh, cue marks which were removed during the restoration, uh, and subtitles, blah blah blah, new, new essay in the booklet that we saw, uh, limited edition of 2000 for the UK. Um, yeah, it's just a remarkable, wonderful film that if you like horror in general, it doesn't need to be early horror, doesn't need to be world horror. If you just like horror, this is essential. This is now top tier for me. It's one of the best things Indicator have ever released um, in terms of the film itself. And I'm so glad that they've kind of broken their um, their rule, you know, not rule, but you know, self-imposed. Uh, we're not doing too many non-English language things uh, recently because they've done like, Irreversible and uh, you know we've now got these these Mexican films I think if they're especially now they're trying to crack the US market I think having 
being open to a more diverse uh, lineup is is uh, is a major plus. Um, and pff, if it leads to any more like this, then by God, we're in for a treat. But this is from the blurry of the years so far, as far as I'm concerned. But uh, yeah, that is that is the bundle for Indicator this month. So unfortunately, the bundle offer is over, but the new one's on. So if you pick up the new one, you can get um, the World War Two uh, film, which I can't remember the name of, uh, um, but also Columbia Noir Volume Five, which is all Bogart films. Some of them aren't really noirs, but yeah. we won't quibble too much because it means more Bogart with better special features than some of the French editions. Before you go though, before you go, I wanted to show a real oddity that um, I, I was walking the dog yesterday and um, across the road we've got a charity shop and in the window they had this Blu-ray for a pound and it was so weird and so odd that I thought I need to buy this, I need to buy this. Um, and it may mean nothing to anyone outside the UK but I had no idea this even exists. It is Beulah Quo. It's a film starring Status Quo, the boogie rockers most famed from the 70s. Um, Brick Parfit since died, but Francis Ross, who's carried on, um, it is an actual band, but it's usually just the two of them as the consistent. They survived the 70s, rocked Live Aid, they opened Live Aid with uh, rocking all over the world. But can they escape, escape death in Fiji? Top 10 album, top 10 film. And it's the rock legends, they play themselves, get caught up in a game of cat and mouse after they unwittingly stumble across an illegal gambling den. Witnessing the murder of the latest luckless victim of the gang's favourite pastime, Russian Roulette, uh, the band flee the scene clutching the only evidence that can bring the bad guys down. As the local godfather bays for their blood, can their luck hold out? With the help of seaplanes, speedboats, jet skis, golf carts and scuba, de- scuba gear, status quo and their entourage attempt to evade escape, stay alive and escape paradise unscathed. What the actual fuck? I mean, this was 2013, the garden at the box. The, they'd been going since 1967 or something with their uh, pictures of matchstick men. Um, so this would be like, God, so um, the kind of boogie rock would be like, oh, I'm trying to think of a, uh, an analogy for... Um, God, early Skinnerd maybe, or ZZ Top maybe. Yeah, ZZ Top, because the two of them, that's, that's not a bad one. I mean, another three in ZZ Top, but you know, your main beard, you know, fr- uh, Dusty and um, Billy. I know Dusty passed away, but so, so did Rick, so it's, it's not a bad analogy. Imagine ZZ Top making a movie where they, they go to um, a tropical paradise and, and uh, get caught up in a gangster movie. But in 2013, not their heyday, 40 years after their heyday. That's what we've got here. It's just so weird that I had to pick it up. This, you know, and, and this important cast, John Lovitz is in it. John Bloody Lovitz from Saturday Night Live. Yeah. Craig Fairbrass from all these uh, awful London gangster films. You know, if you can't get Danny fucking Dyer, you get that idiot. And Laura Aikman, I'm guessing she's not related to Rick Wakeman. God, even Rick wouldn't do this. I'd pay for that, actually. If Rick Wakeman did a movie, I'd watch that. Oh, so that's a bit of an oddity. I wonder if Indicator will ever do a stacked release of Beulah Cole. But, um, yeah, there you go. So that is your oddity to end. Uh, I just thought I'd throw that in. Because I'm skipping the box idea today because the bundle was so interesting and I thought, yeah. So, um, big takeaway from, from this is, first of all, My Dog Morgan is a fantastic film with a great performance from Dennis Hopper and it's a stacked edition. In fact, very quickly, I'm going to just show you 
I mean, the other ones have just got reversible covers and booklets, but this has um, big booklet, as you can imagine, and you do get poster, which is that, that cover that we saw there, and then turn it over and we get another original poster, so double-sided poster in there as well. Should have showed that at the time. Um, so yeah, that is a strong recommendation as a film. I've not dug into the special features, as I say, but La La Rona, if you take one thing away from it, watch La La Rona, because that is, just blew my mind. And if you take a third thing away from it, Status Quo did a crime movie in 2013? Must have been a tax thing. There's, there's no way that wasn't some kind of, you know, especially being out in the tropical islands, you know, there's something dodgy going on there. <sighs> anyway. I think that's actually weirder than La La Rona. Um, yeah, we'll cut it short there, well, relatively short, but we managed to have a look at a good few films. and One of the best discoveries of the year and one of the oddest charity shop <laughs> pickups ever. Um, so, um, status quo, um, I've kind of thrown me for six. I had, the, I had a wrap up ready and then, you know, I called it. <sighs> Rocking all over the world. <laughs> right. Thank you very much for watching. Again, pick up La Llorona if you don't want to pick up the whole the whole lot. But La Llorona is an absolute essential horror film. Let that be the message of the day. And I can only imagine that Beulah Cole is also going to be a rather horrific watch in a quite different way. So... <laughs> In a few days, I'll come back and see if I've see if I've watched it. If I've plucked up the courage, I'll let you know. But um, until then, my dears, let's stay safe out there. Why not? Do me a favor. Stay very safe out there. Love and mercy, my dears. Love and mercy.